This is a very special episode for me, as it marks the three-year anniversary of the Astro Guy podcast. First, I need to thank all of you who watch, listen, like, comment, share, and visit our affiliate links. It helps tremendously. I'm also happy to let you all know that now the show is being broadcast on two local TV channels, on Cranford TV 35 and Clark TV 36. It's great to share the show with the locals here in New Jersey. Thank you to all of you for joining me on this journey. This month, we're going to explore the planets, a mountain range on the moon, a space mission update, and then we'll explore the best objects in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. You know this routine. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, comment, like, and share. You can also review us on your favorite podcast platform. All right, enough of that. Let's get ready to enjoy some September astronomy. Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm not an expert. I'm an amateur like you. I'm here to learn and here to teach. So let's enjoy the ride together. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool. Let's begin with our planetary roundup. This month, you'll have the opportunity to observe several of our solar system's planets in the evening and the morning skies. Let's start off with the innermost planet, Mercury. For the first few days of September, Mercury will be visible low in the eastern sky shortly before sunrise. The best time to look for it will be in the first 10 days of the month. Look for it near the horizon as the morning twilight begins to show. On the 1st, Mercury is glowing at magnitude 0.39, but by the end of the month, it will be shining at magnitude minus 1.7. But it will be too near the sun in the sky to be seen. The best warnings to spot elusive Mercury will be the 3rd through the 6th. Likely, you'll need binoculars or a telescope to pick it out of the glowing eastern sky. By the 10th, Mercury will have begun heading toward the sun and will become challenging to see. As September begins, Venus is shining brightly low on the western horizon after sunset. This is not the best apparition of Venus, and we won't see it get as high in the evening skies as it sometimes does. As September begins, Venus will be very low in the west after sunset, setting just after 8.30 p.m., but it will be shining brightly at magnitude minus 3.9, while spanning a little more than 10 arc seconds wide, and it will appear nearly fully illuminated. By the 30th, Venus will set at 7.55 p.m., giving you some time to observe it. It will be glowing at magnitude minus 3.9 while showing an 85% illuminated gibbous phase that spans just over 12 arc seconds wide. Venus is always a spectacular sight, so keep your eye out for it. On the evening of the 4th, if you have an excellent western horizon, the moon pays a visit to Venus. Begin scanning the western horizon about 40 minutes after sunset to spot Venus. Binoculars should help you to pick it out of the twilight glow. Once you spot Venus with binoculars, you should be able to spot the 2.7% illuminated waxen crescent moon, just 6 degrees northeast of Venus. Having a good horizon and wide field binoculars will help you to spot the very young moon and Venus in the same field of view. It should be an amazing sight. Mars continues to shine in the morning sky. You can spot the red planet in the pre-dawn hours, rising higher and becoming more prominent as the month goes on. Mars will be located in the constellation Taurus as September begins, but it will move into Gemini by the 6th. On the 1st, the red planet rises at 12.33 a.m. and will be shining at magnitude 0.78 while showing a disk nearly 7 arc seconds wide. By the end of September, Mars will have brightened to magnitude 0.48, and its disk is now spanning almost 8 arc seconds wide. As the year goes on, Mars will get better, as it will be at opposition in January of next year. You'll need a telescope to see any surface details, such as the polar caps, dark markings, and other features. A solid mount, quality eyepieces, and patience will help you spot some of these details. 
On the morning of the 25th, the 44% waning crescent moon will appear about 4 degrees north of Mars. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, will be a standout in the night sky this month. It spends all month between the horns of Taurus the Bull. On the 1st, Jupiter rises at midnight and is glowing brightly at magnitude minus 2.2, while the disk of the planet spans nearly 39 arc seconds across. Rising earlier each evening, Jupiter will rise just after 10 p.m. on August 31st, while shining at magnitude minus 2.46 and spanning 42 arc seconds across. Jupiter's four largest moons, the Galilean moons, are easily visible through binoculars or a small telescope, and observing their dance around the planet is always a fun thing to do. If you have several clear nights in a row, try sketching Jupiter and its moons and watch how the moons change position each night. On the morning of the 23rd, Jupiter will be 9 degrees southeast of the 65% illuminated waning crescent moon. On the 24th, Jupiter will be 8 degrees southwest of the 54% waning crescent moon. Saturn spends all month in the constellation Aquarius. On the 1st, Saturn rises around 7.45 p.m. and is shining at magnitude 0.6, and its disk spans 19 arc seconds wide, while with the rings, the system is spanning just over 44 arc seconds wide. By the end of the month, Saturn rises at 5.44 p.m. and will have dimmed slightly to magnitude 0.66, it will appear about the same size that it was at the start of the month. On the night of September 8th, Saturn will be at opposition, where it appears opposite from the sun in the sky. Saturn will rise at sunset and be visible all night long. The weeks before and after opposition are the best times to observe Saturn, although it's always a stunning sight in any telescope when you can see it. On the morning of September 17th, observers in parts of the western United States and Canada, as well as parts of Southeast Asia and Northern Australia, will have the opportunity to see Saturn disappear behind the nearly full moon. Depending on your location, you may be able to see Saturn reemerge from behind the moon as well. Observing an occultation like this with a telescope will be an adventure that you'll never forget. I'll leave a link with more information about the occultation in the show notes, with timings and maps. Uranus is visible all month long in the constellation Taurus. On the 1st, Uranus rises at 10.47 p.m., while at the end of the month, it rises at 8.38 p.m. It will be easy to spot around 5 degrees south and 1.5 degrees west of the Pleiades all month long, while at magnitude 5.7, it's faintly visible to the naked eye under a dark sky from city lights. To see it easily, a really good pair of binoculars or telescope will be needed to reveal this distant, icy cold, bluish green world. Lastly, Neptune reaches opposition on September 20th. It is in the constellation Pisces all month long. Neptune is faint and requires binoculars or a telescope to see it, but having the opportunity to view Neptune is a rewarding challenge for any avid stargazer. On the 1st, Neptune rises at 10.21 p.m. and is glowing dimly at magnitude 7.7. .7. The planet spans about 2.5 arc seconds wide. At the end of the month, Neptune is roughly the same brightness and size due to its distance from us, but it's now rising at 6.12 p.m. You'll want to use a planetarium app like Stellarium to help you pick Neptune out from the background stars. On Sunday, September 22nd, the Sun will cross the celestial equator, going south until it reaches the solstice in December. This marks the start of autumn in the northern hemisphere and spring in the southern hemisphere. On this date, nearly every place on the planet will experience equal amounts of day and night. Personally, I say welcome autumn. It's my favorite season of the year. Now it's time for a quick space mission update. For starters, the Starliner and its two astronauts are still on the ISS, and it appears that they're going to be there for quite some time. On August 24th, NASA announced that the Starliner will come back to Earth unmanned in early September. Unfortunately for Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, they'll have to remain on the station 
until February of 2025, when they'll make a return trip in a SpaceX Dragon capsule. SpaceX has scheduled to launch the Polaris Dawn mission on the morning of August 27th in a Dragon capsule on top of a Falcon 9 rocket. This is the first mission of the privately funded Polaris program. The mission will last about five days in orbit and has several ambitious objectives. It plans to reach altitudes higher than any previous Dragon missions. It will conduct the first ever commercial spacewalk with specially designed SpaceX spacesuits, and it will navigate through parts of the Van Allen radiation belts. Additionally, the mission will focus on medical research in microgravity and will test laser-based Starlink communications technologies in space. The Crew-9 mission is scheduled to fly a crew to the International Space Station on September 24th. This will be another Dragon Falcon 9 combo launch. After June's successful test of the SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy, SpaceX has pushed back Integrated Flight Test 5 to September. As of this recording, the exact launch date hasn't been announced. However, the goal for the flight will be similar to the previous flight, but it appears that SpaceX will attempt to safely land both the Super Heavy and the Starship. These tests have always been exciting and fun to watch, and I'm sure that this one will be as well. Launched in April of 2023, the ESA's JUICE mission, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, made a close flyby of the moon on August 19th. The craft came within 750 kilometers, or 465 miles from the lunar surface. On August 21st, JUICE flew by the Earth as it performed another gravity assist maneuver to build up speed for its flight to Jupiter. To commemorate its historic lunar encounter, JUICE captured a series of photos using its onboard monitoring cameras, which were initially designed to verify the deployment of its solar arrays and scientific instruments. This lunar flyby is just one of the many steps on JUICE's long journey to explore Jupiter and its icy moons. It's likely that JUICE will teach us a great deal about Jupiter's moons when it reaches the Jovian system in July of 2031. Now it's time for the Lunar Feature of the Month. This month, we're going to explore an interesting feature on the moon, Montes Alpes, also known as the Lunar Alps. These peaks were named after the European Alps by the Polish astronomer Johannes Helvius in the 1600s. The Montes Alpes range spans an area on the moon nearly 280 kilometers, or about 174 miles long. The lunar Alps form a prominent triangular shape, making them pretty easy to spot in a telescope. Finding them is also easy, as they're located along the northeastern edge of Mare Imbrium, known as the Sea of Rains. The Alps also border Mare Fragoris, the northern sea of cold. This lunar mountain range has peaks that average about 2.4 kilometers, or roughly a mile and a half high. Several of these mountains soar higher than this average. The tallest peak is Mons Blanc, which reaches an impressive height of 3.6 kilometers, or 2.2 miles high. One of the coolest features of Montes Alpes is that it's divided by a rift known as Vallis Alpes, which we discussed in the What's Up in the August Skies episode. I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. As you observe the lunar Alps, you'll notice that their southern end tapers off in two distinct capes. These are known as Promontorium Agassiz and Promontorium de Ville. These capes mark the boundary between the mountainous terrain and the lava-filled plains of Mare Imbrium. This area is especially beautiful during the lunar sunrise, when the low angle of the sun casts long, sharp shadows from the mountain peaks across the mare creating a dramatic contrast with the rugged lunar surface. So next time you look up at the moon, take a few minutes to explore the lunar Alps and appreciate the scale and beauty of this lunar mountain range. It's amazing to me to look at the moon and see landscapes there that rival even the grandest mountains here on Earth. Moving on to our deep sky tour, let's dive into what is probably my favorite autumn constellation, Cygnus the Swan. Cygnus is bisected by the Milky Way, which is why it's loaded with so many great objects to observe. On September evenings, Cygnus is high in the sky by the time it gets dark, and it's a great constellation to start a night of observing. 
Let's start our tour with what many believe is the prettiest double star in the night sky. I'm referring to the colorful double star known as Albireo, or Beta Cygni. Albireo is easy to spot with the naked eye, as it glows at magnitude 3.35. It's easy to find it, as it is the star marking the head of the swan in Cygnus, or also what's known as the bottom star in the Northern Cross. In a telescope, you'll easily see its two component stars, one blue and the other gold. They are a stunningly beautiful pair to observe, and it makes for a fun object to show people who've never looked through a telescope. A great trick to see the colors is to defocus the stars a bit, and as the stars appear to expand, you should be able to notice the colors even more. The two stars are separated by about one arc minute, making them easy to split in any telescope and even some binoculars. Albireo is located about 420 light years away from us. Once you've had your fill of Albireo, we'll move on to our next object, NGC 6888, the Crescent Nebula. This emission nebula glows at magnitude 7.4, but due to its size, it spans 12 by 18 arc minutes, but its light is spread out, so it has low surface brightness, making it a little bit more of a challenge. That being said, I've seen it with 7 by 50 binoculars from a dark location in Vermont, and it's pretty easy to see in my 70 millimeter refractor if I'm using a nebula filter. In any of my 8-inch scopes, it's fairly easy to see from dark skies at low power. However, using a nebula filter, like a UHC filter, makes it even easier to see, and you can see more of the bright rim, lending to the crescent name. I'll leave a link in the show notes for some great UHC filters. Patience and averting your gaze to the edge of the field of view may help you spot it with your peripheral vision. NGC 6888 was discovered by Sir William Herschel on December 15, 1792. I'll leave a link to our episode about William Herschel. The Crescent Nebula is located about 5,000 light years away from us. The nebula itself spans about 26 light years across, and in long exposure images, it almost looks like a brain, at least to me with beautiful red glowing H2 clouds, surrounded by wispy blue glowing clouds of doubly ionized oxygen. The nebula was formed by stellar wind from the wolf rayet star, cataloged as WR136. This star has had many outbursts, the latest one occurring more than 250,000 years ago, and these outbursts created the shock waves that shaped the nebula. WR136 will eventually end its life in a spectacular supernova explosion, but this likely won't occur for millions of years. The Crescent Nebula, while challenging to see, is very easy to find. Spot the Summer Triangle, and then go to the first magnitude star Deneb, the northernmost star in the triangle, and the brightest star in Cygnus. Located just over 6 degrees southwest of Deneb is the magnitude 2.2 star Sater, or Gamma Cygni. From Seder, sweep a little more than two and a half degrees southwest, and you'll find the Crescent Nebula. Our next object is much easier to see. Let's explore the open cluster M29. While this cluster might not be the densest or most dazzling cluster in the sky, it holds a unique charm that makes it worth taking a look at. M29 is a relatively bright and compact cluster, making it a popular target for observers with small telescopes and binoculars. The cluster is located about 5,200 light years away from us. It's made up of around 50 stars. Interestingly, though, only about 20 of those are visible in most amateur instruments. M29 shines at magnitude 6.6, .6, and the cluster spans roughly 3.6 arc minutes across. Locating M29 is easy. From Seder, sweep south a little less than 2 degrees, and you'll spot M29. Our next object is another one of my favorites, and it is my favorite supernova remnant to observe. I'm referring to the Vale Nebula, a large complex of nebulosity that was created by a supernova explosion that occurred more than 10,000 years ago. The Vale is located about 2,100 light years from us, and the entire complex is about 110 light years wide and spans more than 3 degrees across our skies. Because the complex is so large, it actually has several catalog numbers, and many of its individual sections have their own names. For example, 
The Western Veil, also known as the Witch's Broom Nebula, is catalogued as NGC 6960. The Eastern Veil, sometimes called the Network Nebula, is catalogued as NGC 6992. The area, known as Pickering's Triangle, is associated with two brighter knots of nebulosity, catalogued as NGC 6974 and NGC 6979. The nebula is listed at 7th magnitude, but it can be challenging because it's large and it has low surface brightness. Now, I've been able to spot the eastern and western veil with 7 by 50 binoculars from a dark location in New Jersey, but dark skies will help you to find this awesome spectacle. And with practice, you'll be able to spot it easily, even from moderately light polluted skies with the right gear. It also looks great in a low power view in a telescope. My most memorable sessions observing the veil were through my 70 millimeter refractor at 13 power with a wide field eyepiece that yields a view that's more than five degrees wide. In my eight inch Dobsonian at low power, the eastern and western sections are easy to see, especially when using an O3 filter. I'll leave a link to some of those in the show notes as well. Using filters is beneficial as they block most of the light while passing the wavelengths of H2 or O3 or other wavelengths as well, like a broadband filter, like a UHC filter. These filters can offer a view that has much better contrast, which will make the nebula easier to see. The Veil Nebula is easy to locate as the complex is located just south of the stars Zeta and Epsilon Cygni. The Eastern Veil can be even easier to find as it's right next to the fourth magnitude star, 52 Cygni. While this can be a challenge to see, using averted vision along with slowly sweeping the area will help you to spot the nebula. Our next object is a favorite for astrophotographers, but from dark skies, you can see the brighter parts of the North American nebula with binoculars. You can enjoy visual views of this emission nebula through a telescope at low power as well. With the North American Nebula, it's one of the rare objects in the sky that actually resembles its namesake. The North American Nebula is cataloged as NGC 7000. It is listed at fourth magnitude, but it covers almost two degrees of sky. This emission nebula was first discovered by Sir William Herschel on October 24th, 1786. It is located about 1600 light years away from us. Observing from Vermont, I've been able to see this with binoculars. The brightest section, the area around where Mexico would be, is called the Cygnus Wall, and it appeared as a ghostly, jagged line. In my 70 millimeter refractor at low power and using a nebula filter, the shape of the nebula becomes obvious. This is under a dark, moonless sky as well. I have been able to see it with my 8 inch Dobsonian at low power from a dark sky site in New Jersey. Again, patience and practice will help as well. And once you do see it, it will be a rewarding experience. Finding NGC 7000 is easy. Start at Deneb and sweep three degrees east and you should see the nebula. Next up is the open cluster M39. Situated about a thousand light years from us, M39 is comprised of around 40 stars. It's bright at magnitude 5.5 and spans about 29 arc minutes, about the same size in the sky as the full moon. Using binoculars, the cluster appears as a hazy mottled patch of light, but in a telescope, you should be able to resolve around two dozen stars. This is a beautiful cluster that looks best in binoculars or a telescope at low power. Finding M39 is easy. Start at Deneb and sweep nine degrees east until you come to a fourth magnitude star. Now, sweep a little less than three degrees north and you'll spot M39. Our last object on this month's tour is the emission nebula IC5146, which is known as the Cocoon Nebula. This object is really four objects in one, as it's comprised of an emission nebula, a reflection nebula, a dark nebula, and an open cluster. Inside the Cocoon Nebula is a newly developing open cluster. The cluster is part of the IC5146 complex, but it is also cataloged as Colander 470. The cluster is listed at magnitude 9.5, and some of its member stars are only around 100,000 years old. The nebula glows at magnitude 7.2 and spans 12 arc minutes in size. The nebula is nearly 15 light years wide, and it's located about 4,000 light years away from us. The dark nebula 
forms a dark lane in the brighter emission nebula. The dark nebula is cataloged as Barnard 168. The cocoon is an active star-forming complex that has been intensively studied by several space telescopes, and they have discovered dozens of young stars within the cocoon. From dark skies, you can see the cocoon with binoculars as a small, faint, ghostly patch of light. In my 70 millimeter binoculars, the nebula appears as a roughly circular glow, while in my 8-inch daub, about half a dozen members of the cluster are easy to see, and the dark nebula reveals itself as dark patches within the emission nebula. The reflection nebula is difficult to see visually, but with a 12-inch or larger scope under dark moonless skies, you might be able to spot it. Once you've found the cocoon, you'll return to it again and again. To find the cocoon, imagine a line from Deneb to magnitude 4.5 for Lacerda. The cocoon is located three quarters of the way along that line from Deneb. I do hope that you'll go out and enjoy these wonders that Cygnus has to offer and that they become favorites of yours as well. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or a voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook. You'll find other members, videos, blogs, and lots of other useful information there for your enjoyment. You can also visit our YouTube channel, the Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Please subscribe. Please consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform. It helps us to get new listeners. If you'd like to support the Astro Guy Podcast and YouTube channel, you can simply buy us a cup of coffee. The money is used to maintain and update the equipment that we use to create and publish the show. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for listening, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum, seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night.